If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, we start off by talking about Adam's favorite cartoon, Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo-Doo. Ruh-roh. Ruh, ruh. Then we talk about Gilligan's Island. For those of you youngsters, uh, ask your mom and dad. They know exactly what that's <laughs> oh, all about. God, make us feel old. Oh, man, the skipper. Then we talk about the benefits of learning how to sell in the fitness industry. That's Selling right. that dream. If you can sell fitness, you can sell anything. Uh, we talk about the heydays of 24-hour fitness. Of course, those are the days that we were there. Yeah. Um, and then we talk about effective leadership. Uh, this is one of our favorite subjects, and uh, Adam loves to go on tangents on that one. We don't want to miss leaders. that one. Did I? Then, you go, then we get into the questions. The first question is, uh, if you build strength and muscle, and then you lose weight, is that good for your lighter body? In other words, strength to weight ratio, how important is that? Then we get into why we put tests in prime uh, our prime program and why they're pass or fail. A lot of assessments use uh, different metrics in terms of trying to assess your movement, your body. We chose the very simple pass or fail. Why? Why did we do that? Find out in this episode. Then we talk about uh, what to do when you can't eat more calories and carbs because you have a sensitive gut, but you still want to put on still muscle want to size. shovel it in. Yeah. What do you do now? Like I want to gain some muscle, but my gut is giving me the poops. Ooh. Then we talk about a gentleman who's getting married in late September, and he would like to know... God bless his soul. The best water restriction protocol to dry out yeah. Yeah. for the big day. Yeah. Horrible idea, buddy. Uh, we think he's super confused, and we try to help the fella out. Yeah. Also, finally, I'm going to read a special announcement from Doug, our producer. If your muscles are not firing properly, you will not see results in the gym. MAPS Prime is designed to fire up your central nervous system and promote optimal recruitment patterns and muscle firing so that you get substantially more out of your current workout. It is the only pre, intra, and post workout supplement you need to maximize muscle growth and performance in the gym. MAPS Prime Pro is a comprehensive assessment and correctional program that's designed to address the function of all parts of the body for optimal performance and function from head to toe. It also helps you overcome pain. There are seven pass or fail tests that allow you to identify dysfunction in your neck, shoulder blades, wrists, lumbar spine, hips, ankles, and feet. Once identified, we include advanced tools that are employed to correct those issues. For anyone who has pain or wants to maximize performance, and for all you fitness professionals, MAPS Prime Pro is the program. This month, and I believe there's only four days left when this particular episode airs, we have the Prime Bundle, which includes both Maps Prime and Maps Prime Pro at a massive discount. If those programs sound interesting to you, and they should, enroll at mindpumpmedia.com. Four days left for this special bundle. Do you guys ever wonder why they call these things microphones? Were the original ones? Why, why are they micro? Were the original ones bigger than this? Yeah. Megaphone. Doug, right? do you know what? Yeah, the. The megaphone. Well, that's a good point. Any idea why they right. call it a microphone, Doug? I have no idea. Why would they call the other one a megaphone? Well, mm. a megaphone makes your voice louder. Yeah. So if you do it, like if I put it in front of my face right now, well, or if one of you guys puts well, it in front of your face, well, so a microphone condenses your right, voice. That's right, that's what I was going to say. That's exactly what <laughs> Boom! Happened. Boom! Yeah. That's what it is, right? We solved the riddle. We figured it out. I feel like Scooby-Doo. I know. <laughs> you're, you're Thelma. <laughs> Doinks! You're Thelma. Yeah. Uh, Adam's Daphne. And, wait, wait, wait. Uh, which one's the which one's Daphne? I'm Scoob. I thought I was Yeah. yeah. Oh Scoob. Yeah, you're, Scooby. You're Scooby. You're for sure. <laughs> you're for, whoa. Yeah. You're for sure Scooby. Yeah. And you're so you're the hot chick? No, Scoob. Adam. What does she do? I forget what she does. Uh, she she doesn't do a lot. She, 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 she just lifts a lot, does she? Yeah. She just runs, dude. Right? She's just like <laughs> Yeah, whatever I do, you said it's great. Yeah, <laughs> dude, <laughs> she like goes. Yeah, talk about an old show that I used when I was a kid. I was like thinking in my head, like I guarantee they're all fucking each other. For uh, sure, Gilligan's Island. They have a van. You guys oh, remember boy. Gilligan's Island? Yes, for sure. There was some crazy shit going on there. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. Did I didn't you watch ever watch that, Skipper Adam? Come I on, have, man. but I didn't watch it a lot. Mm. So you know why? <laughs> I used to know the song. Come here, real- little buddy. Yeah. Like, I think they had a thing. Yeah, they did. Yeah. I, the reason why I know the song so well is because when I'd have a sales counselor 
who just spent way too much time. This is when I would manage gyms, by the way, for the audience who doesn't know what I'm talking about. When I'd have a sales guy, you know, when you manage gyms, what you do, part of the sales process is you give people a tour of the gym and show them around. Yeah. And, you know, we'd always uh, have three those, hours. Yeah. We always, had that, yeah. we always had that sales guy yeah. that would spend an hour and a half <laughs> yeah. with one guest. And yeah. then the guest wouldn't even enroll. They'd walk them. They'd oh. walk them out. So I'd get on the intercom and I'd do the Gilligan's Island oh, song. Oh, nice. Yeah, three hour tour. And we'd do the whole song. <laughs> because <laughs> public. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because public shaming is extremely effective motivation. I, I tell you what, man. Those were some it is. of. It's motivating. Those were some of the good old days. I, I That atmosphere. Um, Man, for a guy like me who was young, athletic, and competitive, I don't think I could have fall. I could have fell into a better yeah, place. They fostered that kind of. Sure, you, sure, you could have. You imagine if we fell into an environment that was like investments or tech, we'd be millionaires. I don't know though. It, the it, fitness industry. Damn. What they? I don't know though because not a lot of play. Maybe now I don't know. I don't know what the the landscape looks like. But the landscape was just so awesome there. Everybody yeah, was okay. young, fit vibrant hungry uh, hungry yeah competitive and it was Banging a in in the uh, cycling room what we were, i don't Everybody know where that came that. from <laughs> <laughs> it was in the you know it was during the time too where i felt like personal training was on the rise especially here in the silicon valley it seemed like you know if anybody and everybody who had money it was like a cool thing to have a personal trainer so to sell personal training was pretty easy, so what a good time to learn how to do it well, you know, when it's a little bit easier. The thing about sales in, in gyms and why some of the best, and I'm not just saying this because I'm biased, by the way, because I've trained uh, and worked with on side businesses some of the some other extremely successful salespeople. I've worked with real estate agents who are, um, you know, among the top uh, in the country. I've worked with insurance agents who do ex- extremely good sales, uh, car salesmen. But the best salesmen I've ever worked with in my entire life, and this is salesmen and women, were in gyms. And the reason, I think, the theory I have behind this is because the sales cycle is so fast that it's just constant practice. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like if you're There's a, a lot of people that are right, coming you can see, in and out. Like if you're a real estate agent, the between you know getting a lead, turning it into a you know a, a getting a customer who actually buys from you, that could take months Mm -hmm. one person Mm -hmm. if you're in a busy gym at 24 fitness we would have we would sell i mean tons of memberships every day 30 memberships that's why you got mad that it was a three-hour tour right because you knew how many other people you probably could have took on that tour and closed yes but there's there's also there's also the the one of the biggest sales pitfalls in that you see is where people just fucking sales people just talk too much and talk people out of it, yeah, and yeah. Uh, it, you know, a three to, to sell a gym membership should not take two hours. If it is, you're talking them out of it by that point. So, but uh, just the sales uh, uh, cycle so fast that if you're a good salesperson in a busy gym, and I ran some of the busiest ones in the Bay Area, you're going to see 10, 15 people a day. Right. And doing this whole process. Just reps. You, just tons of reps. So I know, I know, you know how many salespeople I know, I'm sure you guys do too, who worked with me, who were excellent, who moved on to other uh, arenas and just became killer. Oh, it was an incubator. It just was an incubator killers. for talent. You yeah. know, they would just go in whatever direction. And if they killed it there, you knew they're going to kill it somewhere else. Uh, so you have that. And I think that's very true. But I have a theory that a lot of it has to do too with what you're selling. So when you go to a, you know, real, like you said, real estate, car dealership, um, car stereos, I mean, anything, mattresses, those are all tangible things. Yeah, I can get you on a mattress and say, feel how good this feels, right? This feels amazing. It feels better than the one you're sleeping on. I can bring you to a home and say, look how much nicer this home is than the one you live in right now. How would you like to be here? Like yeah. these, there's things- You're selling a dream. With right, the- you are selling yes. something that is not tangible. So the art of that, so ma- learning to master selling something that somebody can't touch- is truly, I mean, you can't get any better uh, training ground for a salesperson. Like, it, it only gets easier from there. Like, hey, I sold something that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Now you're going to give me a job where I actually have something that the person could touch and feel? Yeah. Fuck, this is easy. Yeah. You know, so that's how yeah. I would look at it. And I think that's how a totally. lot of guys that evolved from the business that worked with us looked at it. it was like, man, the last 10 years of my life, I've been selling people a fucking dream of what they're going to look like one day, it's which true. most of them, which we all know that 80% of them never fucking it's, do. It's very true. And one of the... Yeah. 
yeah. biggest mistakes when I would manage gyms and do sales. I did sales training for uh, the region and then for the division at one point. I did this big sales meeting. And one of the things I talked about uh, that I was taught um, early on by some of the people I worked with was to stop selling the features uh, of the gym. And this, uh, you don't see this so much in other areas of sales because in other areas of sales, they teach you to sell the features. Like that's what you sell, right? So if you're coming in to buy, like Adam says, you know, a stereo, I'm going to sell you all the features of the stereo. The problem with that is that they can find the same stereo somewhere else, and if they find it for cheaper, yeah, it, you're, they're gone. Right. Yeah. So it'd be and, more effective to really just tie in an emotional component. That's there. it. Yeah. That's it. Like when I'm selling fitness, I'm not selling you my gym. That's doing it itself. Like we're walking around, and I'm showing you the gym. You're taking a look, and that's nice. Wow, that's great. But what I'm selling you is me, the dream, and why you're gonna, why you can get this dream here, and why you can't get this dream anywhere else. And once you do that, um, then then everything else is uh, is easy. But if you sell features, you're you're fucked because someone else can have better features or ch- the same features for cheaper. Right, or it becomes yeah. a price war at that point. And you're, you got to be able to sell the experience and the dream of it, man. That's that's, what, that's why I think. I mean, between what you said and what I was just saying is, I mean, it was. And do you then, guys know any guys that are millionaires now that were selling memberships with us? Oh yeah, absolutely. I know quite absolutely. a few. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's that's what's so fascinating to me is that how many of them came from that and started. Like, and during that time, uh, you know, we were also blessed to be a part of uh, not just a good company, the company in the fitness industry. Nobody. They wrote the playbook. No, yeah, nobody was doing anywhere near the revenue. It's like uh, getting a chance to be a part of the UFC during its you know growth years and turning into what it is now. We got to be a part of that with a the gym industry and fitness industry when uh, Twenty Four Fitness was dominating. Some everybody. of these clubs were profiting, pro- and I know because we did the you know we were worked on the profit and loss statements. Some of these clubs were literally profiting by themselves, just one location, millions of dollars a year after they pay their massive staff, after they pay their, their you know, the, the, awesome. uh, everything, the, the, the rent, the, the cost of advertising for that particular location, like everything, the profit, millions of dollars for a gym. And I'm just going to tell you this right now, if you have dreams of becoming a millionaire, Buying a gym is one of the hardest ways you can, or, or opening a gym is one of the most difficult. This is one of the conversations yeah. I had with Ben Pack the other day we, when we were working out, and he was asking like about you know guys that I know that own gyms and you know wh- why we didn't and this and that. And I said, man, you know I was you know all of us were really blessed to be a part of a, a company during these the heydays, and I, I mean at twenty years old. You know, I was uh, managing P and Ls for a gym that was anywhere between one to five million dollars a year uh, year in profit that I had to manage, and I and I saw that, and I saw what it took to produce that kind of revenue, and you know, and after I had done that for long enough, realized that I don't want no fucking part of this. <laughs> like, this is not as easy as everybody thinks it is. It's not as simple as, hey, get a cool gym and, you know, oh man, you know why this gym isn't doing good? You need the donkey calf raise machine in here and you don't have, <laughs> you don't have enough. And if you had some better plasmas in here, I mean, that's what like the average trainer or the Where's average the person, blaster machine? They, they look at all these like little details about the gym that they would enhance their experience. And so they think, like oh I would do a gym so much better than this gym and it's like dude that's not what makes a gym make millions of dollars uh, what, yeah. what, what was your I mean I saw let's you talk about numbers right like so the shittiest gym in the Bay Area okay Capital McKee is the most profitable so well, and it's a, out of the AAA gym yeah, yeah out it, of the big ones yeah in the in the area in San Jose it, yes in the 90s and early 2000s shithole when, <laughs> <laughs> shithole it is a shithole it and it makes it you, yeah. a lot of your customers don't speak english a lot of them will come in and even that you got to speak spanish to them because it's just a, it's but a, that talk about an eye-opening thing for someone who's, but they crushed yeah oh, yeah and they're fitting a need in that community and so That's anybody right. who's thinking about opening a gym and they have these great uh idea grandiose ideas on oh it's going to be like this and it's just the like the gym attracts people like oh if you have this badass gym then then it attracts people like no bro you're going about it all wrong it doesn't work that way in fact you know in my experience all the and i've managed tons of gyms and i've i've looked at reports on all of them like so we part of not only running all these p l's and numbers for these gyms that we were running we also got to go to monthly meetings where we compared each other's revenue that's what was awesome about the 
company was that I could see this guy over down in Southern California, how much he was profiting over uh, over his, and I could see what this guy was doing over here. And you start to you start to collect all this information, and you start to realize and, that, and you realize that we were in the best part, the best area for all the uh, the clubs. And what I mean by that is. Not that we were in the uh, in an area that was easiest to make the biggest profit, but we all the the killers and the and the systems and the uh, the processes that were extremely successful came out of this area, and a lot of it was here. Like, I I mean I'd run clubs that had been around for I mean Sunnyvale was an old that was an old flagship club that I ran when I was in there. I mean every month the pool the pool was broken, it was old, it would turn green. I used to tell people it was uh, emerald green water, so special. Yeah, but it wasn't. It was broken. Uh, the ceiling, the ceiling broke in, uh, cave in in the operations manager office. We had racquetball in there because it was an old club, just like Capital. And I was producing, you know, competing with clubs that were grand opening, massive clubs in these beautiful, like Thousand Oaks and all these areas in Southern California and other parts of the country. And the only reason why they were competing numbers wise was because they had these great gorgeous beautiful clubs the bay area had didn't have a grand opening club for a long time and we were we were killing it because we had such crazy teams so it was it was awesome to be a part of of all of that i remember some of the i mean it wasn't it was a, a lot of it was intense i remember meetings i'll never forget dude i was in a, i was in a meeting that was uh being given by i can't say his name but you guys know who it is uh, he was a n- notorious uh, manager, district manager, vice president, and you know mm-hmm. he, he now he's. I mean, he moved up to divisional president, um, individual who was giving a meeting, and the last thing you ever wanted to do in his meeting was be caught not paying attention mm-hmm. because it would be it would be all bad for you. Well, we had a guy that worked for us in our club, who I loved. I loved him to death. Great guy. I actually passed away recently. He was a uh, he had some alcohol problems, but he'd been in the club forever. And um, the club that I the club was God, didn't he pass away? The guy you're talking did. about right now? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. The club there was a next to us was a bar, and uh, which was perfect for him because he'd go back and forth between the bar. Right, that's an, that's another story. Right, but he uh, he kind of started dozing off in this long meeting where we were going over PLs or whatever. So he dozes off, falls asleep. So so and so guy who's giving the meeting looks at everybody, and gives us the shush sh- sign, like don't make any sound. And he opens the door real quietly, wheel because this guy was ch- sitting in a chair with wheels. Wheels him out and fucking rolls him out to the workout floor. <laughs> and his chair spinning, he wakes up halfway through, falls over. He's like, "Don't you ever fucking fall asleep in my media again?" And walks in. I mean, this was this some of the some of the atmospheres that we were a part of was just intense, dude. Yeah, I know. Intense. It's, it was like it was. It, funny. Yeah, I, I've got uh, plenty of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're making me laugh right now. I know because right? I know I'm sparking some. Well, yeah, and I some can't memories, and, you dude. know. And I'm like, how do I even tell that story without fucking incriminating people and stuff? I mean, it was, it was wild. It was different, you know. And it's it's a different culture now, right? It's it's it was an insane. You can't do the you can't you can't yell at employees like oh, you used to be able to yell at employees. You can't say things like that anymore. And so, dude, I I, I, I also think there's I also think that this has caused. Um, I think it's a, a reason why a lot of companies right now struggle because I think there was a lot of motivating the restrictions. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of motivating factors behind that. Now, do I think it's still possible? Absolutely. I mean, but I think you have to be a little more creative on how you how you build a team like this now. And I think we've gotten away from uh, building these these great this great culture. And that was what was I could always tell when I walked into a facility. Uh, I still to this day can tell when I walk into a gym, um, I can feel the energy of, Mm -hmm. of the gym. The moment I walk in just from the front desk Mm -hmm. to the employees that are walking around to the members that are inside there to just the energy just that's getting, that's being put off in that place. And it always translated into dollars. You could always tell the clubs that were struggling revenue wise. You could feel it when you you walk in. Yeah, you could feel it. Cause again, you could feel it when you call them, right? You get on the phone and how they answer the phone, the way they talk to the phone. I mean, the, the irony of the story that I just told was the reason this manager could do that to that person wasn't because they were this abusive, horrible. Because no, he had his respect, right? They they respected each other yeah. so much because I mean, there, and there's I mean, he had done so much for this particular person. There was so much respect that you know, like like I could do something like that 
to one of you guys, or you could do something like that to one of, to me in a in a situation like that where one of us was really taking a shit, and all we would get from from the other from the individual's respect, like fuck, man, you called me out, and you're right, mm-hmm. and it's just. <clears throat> You know, people need to understand that too, because I'll tell stories like that sometimes, and people will be like, "Oh my god, that was horrible." Yeah, it's but like, you don't understand like, the environment. Like, well, talk about the respect level was so high. Talk yeah. about how we create that. I think this is a, a kind of a cool <clears throat> tip or takeaway, and, and I, I think I've addressed this before on the show. This was something that um, I got from the book, the short read, one minute manager that I've talked about before, and it, it, it spoke about this this culture and this this way of leadership where. You know, I stopped focusing on all the tasks that my employees had to do and, and micromanaging them. It's And it's tough. You get in a role, right? You take over a facility. And this could go for any business. It doesn't have to be fitness. It's just in general where you have to lead 5, 10, 20 plus people or whatever into towards the same goal or same direction where, you know, you get in that position and right away you want to think of all the things the guy or the girl before you wasn't doing. How can you hold them accountable and accomplish more and motivate them more to do that? And that was kind of like how it worked. And it took me a while and it took me until I read this book before I had this paradigm shattering moment for me where I completely flipped how I led (laughs) on its head. And, you know, from that book, I began, uh, focusing on all the things that my staff was doing well and was doing right. And I, and I totally stopped paying attention to what they weren't doing and what they weren't doing well. And when I began to lead this way, like it changed everything for leadership for me. And it was such a powerful moment. And it really made me realize what some of these leaders, like the one you're speaking of, how they could get away with like just verbally abusing somebody or just fucking punking them. And that person would respond, right? They would respond well and right. They would do the right thing afterwards. Well, you also know who who that works for and with and who that doesn't. Well, what I found was you there was kind of this formula that you could do. And like everybody was, everyone's unique and different and how much effort you have to put in each one is a little bit different. But for example... You know, I began leading this way where I would, you know, point out when I'd see, you know, Justin doing something with a client, walk over, touch him on the shoulder and be like, hey, dude, I just saw what you were doing. It was a fucking great job, man. And I really appreciate your work that you do around here and then walk away. And once you start to do that enough and you do that consistent, consistent, consistency is everything. You can't do it once or twice. You have to become, you have to be known as that leader who is constantly pointing out the things you do well. Then the once in a while, when I come unleashed, it's so fucking rare, but it's yeah. so powerful. It's like how we talk about using, uh, you know, swear words. Like, it's part of our vocabulary, and I think when used correctly, it's very powerful. When you use the f word, when it's when it's put they, in the right, they exist in 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 human vernacular in every culture and every language for a reason. They can express feeling and and they can communicate better. When used uh, uh, appropriately or properly, yeah. whether it's done for humor or whether it's done for to express, uh, you know, some type of emotion, it could be happiness, sadness, whatever. Curse words exist for that particular reason. That's why they're in. Every, like I said, every culture has words that are, you know, uh, you know, taboo or bad. Right. Or so I feel like nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And if you if you approach leadership like that, where you truly give everything you got passionately mm-hmm. into people. Then when those moments come where you drop the hammer or you swear or you do something that's just out of character like oh, that. It's way more impactful. Oh my god, it's powerful. Yeah. It's yeah. unbelievable. Like, for, for for me to do that cuz you know and it, it, we've on this show before, right? I've I've got the reputation of being the asshole, right? And that's be, not because I'm this guy who's an asshole all the time. It's that I'm not afraid to be that guy. I'm not afraid to be candid. I'm not afraid to tell somebody who I think is doing a fucking shitty job that you're doing a fucking shitty job. But that's because I put in all the hours of stroking that person off and building their character and uh, building their character up and complimenting them for all their hard work and telling them and putting everything I got into them wholeheartedly. So then when I do that, it, it that boy, it's a it's powerful. It's very powerful. And, and it, it it's can, only powerful if someone respects you. That's what people yeah. need to yeah, understand. Yeah, you have to get that first. You can't just do that. Right? You can't run around. And it's got to be well, genuine. Yeah, and that's the same thing I've run into with the best coaches I've ever had, even in athletics. Oh, and, so and, true. 
man, like they just they know when to to properly like snap everybody out of something. And, and you know, a lot of times maybe that is something that maybe comes off a little asshole ish, but it's it's what needs to be said. And you, you can't be afraid to say what needs to be said when the opportunity presents itself. But you don't want to constantly bombard people you know, all the time in, in, in a negative way, it's just not as effective. No, the minute you lose the respect of your team, you're, you're screwed. I don't care if it's sports, uh, business, you know, politics, whatever. They stop respecting you because you're weak or because you think you're strong and you're not, or you're, you push too hard or whatever. The reason why they lose respect for you lose that respect. You're screwed. One of the biggest <clears throat> mistakes that I see, uh, that I used to see gym managers do was they would go in. This is a mistake I see with a lot of businesses is they go in with this customer is uh, always right and the customer comes first attitude. And the reason why that's wrong, I know people are listening, are like, no, that, that's, that is the, <laughs> the right Burger thing. Burger King, man. Yeah, the custom, yeah. customer is first. That's not true. Fuck that. My people it's are your, first. That's right. If your people are first and you treat, it's inverted. It's the and inverted the business culture. triangle. Yeah. If you treat your people as they come first, it's they're the ones that are most important, then the side effect of that is incredible customer service, customer experience, Product efficiency, all that stuff. The best, you know, the, the you know the best gyms that I've ever run into, where I see the members are the happiest, are the ones where the staff is the happiest and the most motivated and the most, mm-hmm. you know, they have the most respect for their leaders and the most connected. The ones where the managers just make it all about the customer and not nothing about the staff, they always are horrible and the customer hates them. So, and this is especially true of a gym which is a service industry, you know, service based. Industry, so you know that it, it can be really difficult. Uh, you know, if you're in a leadership role, to learn how to do this, and it it God, it took me fucking almost all the way towards the end of my career before I really started to put this together because I, I learned to start to look at like my team because before I was always trying to develop uh, develop people to be like me, right? I was successful at what I did. Let me try and develop these, teach these people what I do to be like me so we can be successful and we can win. Right. That was like Mm -hmm. the mentality. And it took me a long time to really start to stop looking at my staff and my team like that. And instead looking at it like a football team would be like, there's a quarterback, there's a lineman, there's a wide receiver. Mm -hmm. Everybody Mm -hmm. is extremely role player. Yeah. Everybody's extremely valuable and they're all valuable for different reasons. And then learning how to not you know I can't get mad at my lineman because he can't catch the ball like my wide receiver so I got to stop even though they're in the same position they were they're playing the same game you know I can't look at them like that I have to be able to separate that and go you know what this is what he's really good at I need to encourage that in him and I need to tell him how good he is at that and I want him to be great at that and I, I I would push that 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 area that he's strong. I'm not going to worry about that he has no hands because you know what? I'm not going to throw him the fucking ball anymore. Like there's no reason to throw him the ball. He's a goddamn lineman. I'm going to keep focusing this <laughs> way. My wide receiver. I'm going to stop expecting him to block or hit people hard because he's a sissy. But he's got incredible hands and he's so talented that way. So when you start to look at your staff and those that are underneath you, and you stop trying to compare them to what you do so well, or maybe the top sales guy or the top producer for you, and stop comparing them and looking at their their individual attributes and their strengths, and then encouraging those those strengths and teaching them how to take those things that they're already good at and be great at it, they begin to excel. And then then telling them what a great job they are. That When I learned to finally do that, it was amazing. It wasn't until I was on my way out, really that I have this type of impact where I no longer had to fucking reprimand or get hard on anybody. In fact, what I found was, you know, if I had just kind of slacked off, you know, a couple of days in a row where I didn't make my rounds of going over and telling my employees how great they were, th- like some of them would make their way to my office and be like, Adam, did I, hey man, did I, did like, I do something okay? Yeah. Did I do something <laughs> wrong or yeah. is there something like they, I had created this culture that of me coming around and telling you what a great job you're doing things that if I didn't make my rounds of doing that instantly, they were already self of self evaluating. What the fuck am I not doing? The boss hasn't come by to tell me what a great job. And they would only be mad at themselves. You know, I didn't have to, or somebody would come and tell me something that they fucked up on that. I didn't even know they did. Like they come over and they would explain themselves like, Hey, you know, boss, I'm so sorry. I just haven't had a chance to get to these files. I know you told me you wanted me to do these stuff like that. And I didn't even know they didn't do them, but because I had, 
hadn't come over to tell him a good job. Some, it was weighing on them, and they were going through their their entire business thinking, like, what could he be mad at me for? And then they would present it to me mm-hmm. and then present that they're going to finish it. It was so it was such a beautiful thing, but it fucking took years and years of coaching and developing and leadership before I kind of pieced that all together. I tell you what, that was probably one of the greatest gems I could pass on to somebody. Powerful. <clears throat> leadership bird. <laughs> Step right up, all you bearded men and all you bearded ladies. This quad is brought to you by Big Top Beard Company, whose all-natural beard oil products not only make your beard smell amazing, but feel amazing, too. Their organic essential oil blends transport you to manly places like the mountains, the desert, the sea, and beyond, all while encouraging a lot of beard nuzzling to boot. Mm. Buy it for yourself or as a gift for that special bearded someone at BigTopBeardCompany.com. Enter the discount code Mind Pump for 33% off at checkout. Our first question is from Double O Silk Drop. Oh, that's our girl. If someone builds strength and muscle via weights and then sheds a few pounds, will their newfound strength and lighter build increase their aptitude for body weight exercises? Uh, Mm, Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. So I noticed this uh, with myself. Every single time, or when I used to do uh, large swings and body weight, you know what I would bulk and cut type of deal. My body weight doesn't really uh, fluctuate that much um, anymore, and my weight might fluctuate maybe five pounds. But in the past, it would fluctuate as much as fifteen, twenty pounds, and I would get really good at body weight movements when I'd get light, um, even though my overall strength many times uh, would go down. So, uh, you know, like I I might not be able to do as much on a squat or an overhead press or even a, you know, a heavy row because I've lost 15 pounds, but my strength to weight ratio is much better. So now when I do pull-ups or push-ups or, you know, handstand push-ups or whatever, I'm repping out uh, reps like crazy. And I remember, I remember putting this together in my early years where I do weighted pull-ups Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, whenever you drop a lot of weight, right? I, like I said, I'd have these big fluctuations. Whenever you have a, a large drop in weight, it's, it's it, many times you lose overall strength. But I, so I remember losing strength in my like barbell lifts, but then I could add more weight around my waist on my weighted pull-ups. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking like, man, no matter what I do, my back just gets stronger. And I was doing this. <laughs> I was talking to my dad about this. I was, like, I was a kid. I was a teenager. Even though you're just putting the weight and on. And I'm like, you know what's crazy? I'm like, you know what's crazy? I'm like, I lost like 15 pounds, but I can do this pull-up with, you know, I added another 15 pounds in my yeah, pull-up. My yeah. dad's like, so Weird. You're lifting, he's all, you're lifting the same weight. the same weight. Yeah. Yeah. I'm you're like, what do you mean? the same thing. He's lost 15 pounds, you added 15 pounds to your weight. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But this is, this is a very, very true thing, and this is the, for many sports and many athletes, not all of them, because some, some sports, uh, excuse me, some sports, Come weight. Sports? Yeah, did Ooh, I say that? that? Sounds oh. sexy. Yeah. Don't, don't Google that. No, sure. <laughs> World champion. The one yeah, sport, what websites are you the on? One sport sounds good at. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Champion. First place. He's so, a master debater. Yeah, at so that one. the uh, uh, some sports weight uh, is good. Like in football, certain positions actually being big and heavy is a good thing. But in many sports, uh, you have weight classes, and uh, so like if you wrestle or you box or other sports that require uh, lots of agility, um, you want to maximize your strength to weight ratio. That's everything yeah. in some of those sports. I mean, imagine if you're a wrestler at 150 pounds and you could, you know, you know, add 15% strength to your body and not gain a single pound of weight on the scale. You're going to move faster. You're going to have uh, more agility, and you're going to be stronger against your 150 pound competitor. Yeah. Uh, you know all this. So again, this is like the, the the holy grail of athletic training for most sports. Well, generally, I mean, your body's going to be a lot happier with you. You know, like the more you 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 actually focus on that element, because you know there are sports specific. Uh, body types that you know people will build themselves up to mass wise um, and you know that might fit for that very specific activity but for an overall general purpose like functionality and applied strength the more you can kind of match that strength to weight ratio in, you know in a favorable manner uh, the better and, and you will find a lot of these like body weight movements and exercises will become like 
you know, way easier and, and, you know, in your joints, um, you know, you don't have the same kind of pains. And, um, a lot of times like our idea of like where we want to get to is, is definitely outside of, and we kind of mentioned like the body weight set point and all that kind of stuff as an example. But, you know, we, we, we try to push beyond that. And a lot of times like your body's like, mm-hmm. you know, we're pushing against our body, like to a certain degree. I think it's important to note that not all things are created equal though. So, if you are, let's say, because I, what, I, what I'm picturing right now with her, because we know who that is, like, let's say she decides like, okay, I'm going to go on a, a, you know, strength building program. I'm going to run MAPS Anabolic. And she sees her deadlift and her squat, you know, go up. She gets much stronger. She adds five pounds. And now she says she wants to lean out, lose some body fat, so drop some down weight. So d- will that translate over into body weight exercises well some things will have great carryover some things not so much for example mm-hmm. I, I could go on a hardcore strength program and do get up to five five hundred and a half pounds deadlifting, but then i can't uh, do more than 15 pull-ups and i could not do any deadlifting and but focus on my pull-ups and i could get better at pulling up oh, yeah there's that, specificity here for sure well i think yeah. that's what i mean by there it's important to understand that not all things are created equal so just because you build strength and then lean out doesn't necessarily mean that it could technically carry over to a specific body weight exercise that you're trying to get better at so that's important to keep that well, in like mind well like her her activity so she does uh, silks which right. uh, my girlfriend was very versed in as well, and silks are for people who don't know. Um, it's it's where they have those those. They're like made out of fabric. They're called silks. They're pretty smooth, but they're not made out of silk. And they hang from a a very very high vantage point, like the ceiling, but a high ceiling. And these uh, these artists, because that's what they are, it's an art, will climb the silks and then perform in the silks with like the splits and these twists and moves and where they'll go down, they'll roll down real fast and catch themselves. And you see this in the, like circuses, like the Cirque du Soleil. We'll do this quite a bit. So. For this particular uh, activity, if you add a bunch of weight to your squat, you're not going to see a lot of carryover. That's what I mean. To yeah. the silks. You know, that's what Adam's talking about. You're not going to see a ton of carryover. Now, if you add a lot of strength to your arms, to uh, your shoulders, to your ability to pull, mm. so your rows and your pull-ups and you know d- dumbbell rows and stuff like that, you add a lot of strength to your grip and you don't gain any weight, you're going to fling your body around uh, very easily up on those silks. It'll be very, very easy to pull yourself up. And In fact, this is why you'll see, like to give you a good example, if you look at male gymnasts, who by the way are some of the most muscular pound-for-pound pound, uh, athletes that you'll find ever anywhere in the world in their upper body, you'll notice in their lower body, although their lower body is lean and not skinny and weak, it's just not big, and that's on purpose. Uh, you don't see a lot of gymnasts doing, trying to build mass in their lower bodies, or at least male gymnasts, because of their competitive movements are, you know, the the hanging rings and day, the yeah. yeah, hanging and flipping and uh, doing the what's that horse called, the pommel horse or whatever. Horse, uh-huh. Which uh, if if you got one of those guys and they built a ton of strength and size in their legs, uh, even if their strength to weight it's ratio was awesome, yeah, head. it's going to make it worse for their upper body. So specificity is uh, very important with this, but, um, you know, if you're looking for this kind of, uh, performance where you want lots, uh, or excuse me, you want an excellent strength, strength to weight ratio, then you should be focused on training your central nervous system Mm -hmm. in all aspects. So, uh, maximal strength, you know, CNS training also control overall Tension and control and all these different positions. Yeah, I was going to say even well. the one carryover, if you want to attribute to uh, like a backloaded squat, is just that sensation of loading, you know, on your back and, and your central nervous system responding to that. Uh, you know, like that, that's just some kind of a stimulus that you'll be able to have, you know, and summon like an irradiation effect of, of being able to have that tensile strength on command when you need it. So uh, I, so I'm glad you said that, uh, Justin, cause, um, I've been reading some of the stuff you've sent me and I've been looking on uh, some more information on isometric training, isometric type exercises, uh, were very popular in the old days of exercise. They, the, it was a prized form of of uh, exercise way back in the day. Mm-hmm. And it lost favor 
uh, as uh, the goals of exercise became more aesthetic fa- uh, based. And what I mean by that is back in the day, a strength athlete was prized for their performance. And then if they looked good, that was cool too. In fact, Eugene Sandow was one of the the first guys that was a strongman that kind of had a six pack. Everybody else before that didn't, nobody gave a shit. It was all about how much weight yeah. they can. So he kind of combined the two of them. But the reason why they prized isometric training, uh, training so much was because it gave you so much strength uh, that was functional that you could add to your lifts. And it doesn't necessarily translate to a lot of muscle un- until you combine it with other forms of exercise. So uh, all of a sudden it was cut out of routines because it was all about pumping up the muscles. Well, if you combine that type of training with, you know, traditional exercise, you'll get crazy strength and muscle. If you just focus on tension, you get crazy uh, uh, strength to weight ratio type strength. Mm -hmm. So that's a great point because if you're looking for this kind of performance and you're in a sport where you don't want to gain a lot of weight, uh, I would say place a lot of attention on on isometric and tension-based movements because you'll see a lot of uh, of carry over there. Quick commercial break, you guys. We keep getting asked all the time, how can I support the Mind Pump family? Here's one of the best ways you guys can. You guys love that Chimera Coffee that we have. Chimera Coffee with a K. You go to ChimeraCoffee.com, put in the discount code Mind Pump for 10% at the checkout. Also, if you guys want to know how I have this luxurious beard and you want one too, go to BigTopBeardCompany.com, put in the discount Mind Pump again, but this time for 33% off. Also, you guys, if you guys have not tried Ben Greenfield's new bars out, they're fantastic. If you want some, go to BenGreenfieldFitness.com forward slash Nature Bite, put in the code Mind Pump and get 10% off. Go check it out. Next up is Cray Manley. Why are the prime tests pass or fail? Good question. Ooh, yeah, this, is a good <laughs> this this was a big piece of our program. It was, it was, yeah. and it was something that you know you talk about these trips where we take off and we hash things out. We go back and forth, and no, no, we can't do. Oh, this is one of those things where we're, we went back and forth, and it was very uh, important. And I remember we all when we all finally agreed, like it's got to be, it has to be this way. We can't. We, it, we can't create something that is any more specific because if we start to do that, we're going to lose a lot of people. It needs to be more general. And what I mean by that is because this is a program that, you know, a hundred different people can buy and out of those hundred people, you know, there could be 20 different um, upper body issues from the shoulder to the neck to you know, whatever in the chest, like muscles that are overactive, underactive injuries, all different unique things that are causing dysfunction in the upper body. Mm-hmm. And we can't, obviously we won't be able to figure out, be able to tell, you know, this person who had the frozen shoulder and this person right here who has, you know, forward head, even though they both have similar things that or similar movements that can help them, they have different issues going on with their body. So how do we make this uh, generic enough that this many people can have it, but then also specific enough that we know that anybody who fails this, these type of movements well, will we help. leave room for you to sort of self-prescribe because, you know, for us to be able to provide something that, you know, in depth, like we're going to have to add a new title to our name uh, right. and get, you know, like there's a lot of legal stuff to go along, not, not to mention, but so what we did is we made it so... Um, we basically can identify different zones and, you know, the basic functioning and, you know, what you should be able to produce, you know, at each joint uh, uh, point with that. And so that way you can kind of see like, well, you know, if I wasn't able to fully retract, you know, and I'm not able to hit this point of my elbow onto the wall, uh, you know, then you fail. So that way, you know, you, you kind of dive deeper on your own. You realize, oh, this is how I'm going to address this one dysfunction um, that, that's not producing in this movement. So the, tra- the trainers who are listening and the, the people in the, um, I guess, in wellness sphere who work with movement are like this, what's, what I'm about to say here. Because when we wrote uh, Prime, we had uh, a few it, uh, epiphanies while writing it. And a lot of it was from our experience working with individuals and trainers and then working with other movement specialists who uh, we you know were blown away by and learn from. And one of that one of those uh, some of the things that we learned was that it's all based off of movement. So mm-hmm. the, the old assessment models and I say old because they're going to be gone everywhere soon. So you guys so a lot of you guys listening right now are probably using some of these old, these models and they're not nearly as effective as a movement based model. If I have somebody 
um, and I'm trying to assess uh, dysfunction, I can definitely use an old model and break them down piece by piece to try and figure out what muscle isn't doing what and how to target that one area, okay? Or I can look at general movement and, and look at movement, know what proper movement looks like, know what recruitment patterns are supposed to look like, and then work on that particular movement and add movements to that movement that strengthen it uh, and put it in a position or at least uh, correct those issues. Uh, and if you do it based off of movement, you don't need to know the specifics. Like I don't need to know why when you do a windmill, mm. uh, you can't do a proper windmill. I don't. It doesn't matter because these are the exercises and movements that are going to help you be able to accomplish that particular uh, movement in that plane of movement. Which is a movement that everybody should be able to do, and that's how right. why it's a pass or fail. That's it's, it. There, there is no like kind of pass. It doesn't it's, even matter why you fail. Right. If, the, if you fail because you have tightness in your lumbar, or if you fail because your scapula won't retract and allow you to get that straight line with your arms, or if you mm -hmm. fail because you're tight in your hamstrings or whatever, it doesn't matter because the solution to that problem, the solution to that, the reason why you can't do all those movements is the same for all of them. Mm -hmm. Because we don't work in, in, in specifics. We have to work based on movement. And the, re and the reason why that's better is because that's how life is. Mm -hmm. If I can make you move better, then you're going to move better. If I correct one small area of your body, I still haven't addressed your movement because now you have to be able to integrate that. Because what the old model was, you find that one thing, yeah. correct that, then work up and then finally work on the movement. And it's like, why? Yeah. Why when if we teach people these, the proper patterning, with these exercises and movements that we know are, are, are general, but will address those issues. If we just do that, it's going to take care of everything else. Yeah. And this is how we were able to break the body up into three zones, three movements, pass or fail. Because regardless of why you fail any which one of them, it's going to point to these particular exercises and movements that are going to correct all the issues that can cause a fail. Yeah, and now so these are data points that you can go off of, right? Like a lot of times people just have an assumption of movement, like their their knowledge base of how their body moves and their mechanics uh, are so. And it's a lot of times like they just they just go through with momentum and they don't realize they they really aren't capable of articulating their joints this specific way. And so once we identify that, that may actually highlight other areas that they realize, wow, this has affected my shoulder and it's been in pain uh, because I actually can't, you know, articulate my joint mm -hmm. this way. So you're not going to figure that out until you it, actually look well, into and we're, it. And we're also, we're also thinking like ahead of what, okay, if someone gets a program online or is training their own program, whatever, there's basic movements like the overhead press, the squat, the you know bench press, whatever, row. These are all movements that are in almost every program somewhere or another that you should be able to perform correctly. And if you can't do the exercises that we put inside Prime, you probably shouldn't be doing a lot of those moves, especially if you can't if complete them uh, with good form without any pain. Yeah. So that's why, too, that we like – we were, we were so excited to finally get that piece out because we knew deep down, even though we released the other programs first because they were completed first, that really Prime and Prime Pro are is the foundation to all the programs yeah. that everybody should go through and assess and at least understand uh, your own personal mechanics and what you need to work on. And then from there, it's up to you to work on it. But it, what I love about it it's one of those things that immediately when you apply it into your routine right away right away you will see a difference immediately if you are somebody you take who, a 10 minute prime session done properly based on your body what you pass or fail you'll know right that second you'll know yeah this is fucking awesome that Just, your it, entire like, body performs better it doesn't take weeks or yeah. months to like you'll know right away you'll get into your extra your regular i don't care what workout you're doing i don't care if it's crossfit if you're a runner if you compete in jujitsu i don't you know yoga it doesn't even matter when you do your normal activity right away you'll get into it and be like that's I have not moved this well this early on in my workout ever before is what you're going to think to yourself. You know that right away. So it's not um, – and that's – and we understood that. I mean, here's the deal. When we used to do assessments as trainers, we were taught uh, a lot of these stationary uh, assessments. Posture, stand. Just stand there and don't move. That does, what does that tell you? It doesn't tell you much. What if I got somebody 
who can move in all these dynamic ways with good recruitment patterns and great balance in their body. They can do great squats and pull-ups and in rows and overhead presses, and they can twist and turn and do all these other st- all this awesome stuff. But when they stand in just regular posture, it looks like forward shoulder to me. That's not going to tell me that that doesn't mean shit. That's just their posture. Mm-hmm. But everything's firing and moving the way it should. Assessments should be based on movement. They should not. There's definitely clues mm-hmm. you can get from stationary positions, but it doesn't tell you even <coughs> even half of the story. Well, this, remi- this reminds this reminds me a little yeah. bit of the rebuttal that we did to Joe Rogan's chiropractor thing when we brought Jordan and Brink on, and they were talking about how that how funny it is how the old chiropractor way would be. They take a screenshot of your you know, your posture, they put you in front of one of those walls and they do an x-ray. Or yeah. Yeah. And they yeah. say, Oh, you have shoulder elevation here and you're one inch longer it here. Tell you and nothing. Yeah. It doesn't tell you, it doesn't tell you anything and nothing tells you, uh, really the story of someone's body till you watch them move. Yeah. And then when you see it and which is what impressed me so much, the first time that I met Brink was, you know, now a couple of years of knowing him, I've never even been on his table before. He's never put me on his table before. It's always been about my movement. Like, take your shoes off, take your socks off, go walk for me, Adam. Okay, now squat for me. Stand up on your toes for me. Do these movements and let me see how your body is communicating with all the muscles and how they all speaking to each other and how they're firing and how is, how are you responding to that? I mean, that it is crazy to think that there still are tests and things out there of uh, no people think people will think that the more the specific frozen assessment type stuff that that's more individualized but it's actually not Mm -hmm. it's not because if i look at a picture of what posture is supposed to look like that does not take into account any of the individual variances between individual because one per two people could have excellent recruitment patterns and excellent movement and have posture that looks different. I could also train someone to be able to stand with perfect posture, but that doesn't tell you much at all about how their body's functioning. This is true for squats. This is true for anything. Like, uh, you know, more recently, we've had these pretty awesome uh, posts that I've seen on Instagram where some of these great uh, doctors and physical therapists are posting pictures of hip joints and they're saying, look, all squats can't look like this because some hip joints look like this. There's nothing you could do about it. So proper movement will look different for this person than it will yeah. for this person. So it's not about like looking like this specific thing or even just looking at an x-ray. Um, it's about how you move. I mean, shit, talk about x-rays. Do you know, and you could talk to if, if you know, a doctor, if you have a doctor friend or if you're a doctor yourself, you can look at two x-rays and you can look at one that's like, oh my God, look at this disc over here. Look at that disc over there. And they have no symptoms. And then this guy over here has got all this pain. And you look at their x-ray and we're like, we can't find any problems at all with your spine. It looks absolutely perfect. Like, It's all about movement. And that's uh, why prime is pass or fail because you either do it right mm-hmm. and you do it under control and everything feels effortless or you don't. And it doesn't matter how bad you fail. Uh, that all the solution is always is going to be these particular exercises to yeah. prime your body for by your far the That's most it. underrated program that we have. I just launched a buddy of mine the other day from <laughs> I've I've talked before on this podcast how I mentor trainers that used to work for me and help them with their business and continue to progress. And I just got upset one day because um, you know he's sitting here asking me this and that. You know, Adam should I do this and help with that and. I'm going through and I'm like, did you watch the the Prime Pro um, webinar that we did? Oh, I didn't have time. I didn't get to it. Well, I said, well, it's on fucking YouTube. You can still watch it for free on there. Oh, oh yeah, I'll get to that. Well, did you ever pick up Prime? Are you are you utilizing Prime with your clients for that? Oh no, I've been meaning. I'm like, you know what, dude? Like, here's the deal. Like, I can't I can't continue to sit here and spend time with you and help mentoring you when. I'm providing a lot of this information for free. And mind you, this is someone close to me that I would give this shit for free if they just asked me. But yeah. if you're not even putting the work in to go through, if you're if you're listening and you're a fitness professional, if you have some anything to do with health and wellness, and most certainly if you're personal training clients, physical therapy, rehab, chiropractor, any of that, and you do not fucking own Prime and Prime Pro, you are missing the boat. I'm telling you right now, that is the one of the best investments that you could p- possibly make for yourself, for your practice, for your clients. Steal it. Make it your own. I don't give a shit, but get the information. Use it because it is the future. It is how everybody will be doing things. And that's, that's one of the beauties of listening to this show is you get 
you get guys like us that are already going through all this stuff and trying to provide it for you. If you have not listened to the webinar online, that was free information that we put out. Take advantage of all this well, stuff. The, the, the thing is, like, we get a lot of questions on, you know, our social platforms and on, you know, our uh, uh, private forum. And they were all these reoccurring questions. And they were all these things that were addressing, like, uh, things that were like, oh, they probably have this and that and the other going on with their joints and they have this kind of type of dysfunction. And we, it was like a broken record to all these very common sort of symptoms that people would have uh, going through their programs and getting to a certain point where they've just bypassed all these sort of prerequisites mm-hmm. and all these different things that they've just tried to numb out the signal. And so we... That's why we put so much time and effort into how we're going to tack- tackle this problem. Like, it, this is a monster to tackle because this is like, um, you know, what we what we would do in our eyes, what we would see in the movement process uh, to identify uh, these things to help people better. So. Did you guys see the article that somebody posted from Brett Contreras on our page today? No, uh, I like glanced over it. Yeah, it, refresh it, my memory. Yeah, uh, it was just a, it was an article that he had written, and he spoke out on this quite a few times. And I and I, there's lots of this that I do agree with Brett for the information he's putting out there because I, I do like a lot of stuff he puts out there. Um, but they were sharing in our forum because uh, a lot of people out there. Uh, in the fitness uh, realm are using like scare tactics of, you know, using words like dysfunction or, you know, you, you're not, you're in mobile or you're hurt here. And so you can't do this. And so that's like this whole, like scare people into thinking that they can't do it properly. Here's all the, I have the, the magical way to fix you. And so he had wrote this out there that, you know, this is what's going on. And he used the example of Usain Bolt who has, a um oh yeah, I did read discrepancy it. in his he's got one he's got a little bit of mild scoliosis or so one leg is slightly shorter than the other right right and he used them as an example of this elite elite athlete who obviously is performing at the highest level and is got all kinds of dysfunction he's totally fine and I said you know I, I think it's a horrible example to use a professional athlete it is because yeah, that's he's the best at compensating he's well he's trying to make the he's trying to make the case that maximum performance in one particular area equals yeah. you know overall health wellness being able to move properly whatever some of the most dysfunctional <laughs> uh, patterns I've ever seen in people are athletes, athletes. Yeah. I, I have dealt with if I were to look at uh you know, a, 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 my all of my clients, right, that I have trained over the years, that uh, have injuries, aches, pains, surgeries, issues going on. Th- more than half of them, for sure, are ex athletes. Mm-hmm. You know that it's caught up to them. Sure, maybe when they were twenty five, they were on top of the world and weren't nothing was bothering them and they were fine. But later on, when all those bad, those poor recruitment patterns that they've had for 20 plus years now that they're they are now working at a desk or more sedentary like the average american now that shit's all caught up to them so i you know what a great what a great topic because uh you know i, I mean i have an example i had a, a kid that i used to train was a high school senior could pitch 90 miles an hour as a high school senior so he was this huge Damn. prospect but had been pitching for a long time and he hired me to get him stronger we lift weights and his right arm was a it was a totally different arm than his left. Mm-hmm. Stronger, way more muscle development on the right side, and so it, it was just crazy how how great he was at performing at his sport, but how dysfunctional he was otherwise. In fact, it twisted him just a little bit. Like you could yeah. see, you know, the difference between uh, the right and left so much that you know that's going to end up causing you know problems in the future. Mm-hmm. What you need to understand is this is how important your patterning is to your life. This is another great example. So uh, my girlfriend just did a post um, on Instagram or she's about to do a post. I just read it at the training hour. And the post is about breathing patterns and how you know important breathing is. And we hear about this all the time with experts. And by the way, if you're not familiar, I'd suggest looking up information on how important breathing is and how bad our breathing patterns become because of stress or whatever. And she explained how we develop poor recruitment patterns with our muscles that cause our breath and our diaphragm and whatnot mm-hmm. because we're in this constant low level of stress. And so people who breathe shallow and create the stress in themselves, it's literally because it's a poor pattern yeah. that they've created and they can't get out of it without training a brand new pattern. So they have to make this concentrated effort. This is what happens with your entire body. Mm-hmm. 
priming your body before your workouts really make sure that you're sending the signal you want to send with your workouts. Otherwise, you end up strengthening this poor uh, patterning. So you have somebody who has got you know really bad forward shoulder because their muscle, their shoulder blades don't pull back. They don't get good retraction. And they go do all the rows in the world. They don't do all the right exercises. All the exercises. They're going to they're yeah. gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna move the way their body uh, the, is a recruitment pattern. Uh, their default pattern has them move. And all they're going to do is make is strengthen that bad patterning. So they're, they're doing all the right exercises. But because they didn't prime properly or get things to fire they want properly, they're just making things worse for themselves. So... Uh, very, very important. You prime your body properly, but it must be movement based. So I guess to you know, circle back to the answer to the question, it's, it has to be movement based, uh, based, and a movement is either good or it's not good. So it's pass or fail. Next up is Italian Queen G. Oh God, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a nightmare. Hi Sal. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't up your calories and carbs because of a sensitive gut, can you still build muscle? I like this question. Because I'm going to change, I'm going to answer it uh, in this way. If you have gut issues, which are, uh, by the way, by the time you have gut issues, that's a signal that something's been going on for a while. So it's like pain, like my knee hurts. The problem started way before the pain. It started before yeah. the knee pain. Like yeah. Whatever I whatever whatever I was doing before for however long I was doing it. And that being said, when it's better, it isn't technically better either. That's right. So once the pain of my knee is gone, you know, once it doesn't hurt anymore, I haven't solved the problem. I've only solved it enough to take away the pain. But Just like your gut, it'll come back. So if you already have gut issues, you've already been doing something to your body um, that's not working for it. And gut issues are, you're lucky for having a sensitive gut, and I'll tell you why. It is a very outward, obvious signal, and uh, you can use it to read what's going on and change things. Sometimes the signals people get are much more subtle, Mm. like insulin resistance, until it's too late and then they have diabetes or, you know, uh, they're getting brain fog, but they don't realize that they're causing things that may promote uh, things like Alzheimer's or dementia. By the time they get that, it's like sensitive gut. It's obvious. You see it right away. Do not ignore that signal. So the answer to this question is, if you have a sensitive gut, you shouldn't be focused on gaining muscle or, or you know losing fat or really anything else. You should be focused on making sure your gut is healthy. And the irony of that is when your gut is healthy, you'll be able to build muscle much, much way easier. easier. Yeah. Way easier. I mean, I'll tell you my own experience, like... It wasn't. Uh, I had some. Uh, I, I I go on and off with gut issues, and it's very, I'm tend to be very sensitive, mainly because I fucked myself for years with uh, supplements and poor eating habits and all that stuff. So it, it wasn't. It was rather recently where I was getting really really bad gut issues, and I had to kind of do this what you know kind of gut uh, reset, where I fast and I take these uh, herbs and supplements that are uh, antimicrobial and antiparasitic and to just kind of get me back on track and then start to rebuild uh, health of my gut. Well, after doing that, it's like all of a sudden strength is going up and I'm building more muscle even though I'm doing the same stuff I was doing before. So uh, don't I, I, you don't want to do both uh, because a lot of times the, the focus of building muscle besides the workout ends up being eat more food, eat more carbs, you know, push more food, and now you've got a sensitive gut on top of it. Um, you're going to be fighting an uphill battle and potentially causing a massive, uh, you know, reaction of your gut, where then you gotta go back and you know take all these steps and maybe stop working out for a while, which you don't want to be put in that position. So I, I try to go to her Instagram page so I could see exactly what she looks like right now. Um, it's private, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's private. Uh, so I have I have a little bit to add to this. I think that a hundred percent, I agree with Sal. And I think that your gut is should be the number one priority. That being said, one of the biggest struggles that I'm having right now for me personally, and let me preface this by saying that where I'm trying to take my body is outside of where my body wants to go, which now means I'm no longer doing what's the healthiest thing for my body. I'm not uh, searching for optimal health right now. I'm searching for the most amount of fucking muscle I can build. That is where my mindset has been for the last four or five weeks. 
And I've tried to keep my carb intake pretty low because uh, it keeps my psoriasis in check. And when I start to uh, increase my carbohydrate intake, I start to notice uh, my psoriasis starts to flare up. So, and of course, this is all probably tying back to my gut. So I have had a hard time building amount of muscle on my body that's beyond where my body kind of wants to be without the use of carbohydrates. So I do believe that there becomes a give and take a little bit. Like if you, if we were, if I'm talking to the bodybuilder guy who is trying to build tons of muscle, doing this on the ketogenic diet is damn near fucking impossible. And no, no smart bodybuilder I know would ever recommend that. In fact, I remember, uh, Ben Pack and I were talking about this when we were training the other day. And I said, man, I, you know, I loved the way I felt health wise on keto. I felt really good and my training was good. My energy was all fine. But man, when it came to trying to put some mass and size on, I just, I hit a point where my body didn't want to go any more than that. So, you know, if someone is struggling with that and you're really aggressively trying to bulk, I could see how this could become a bit of a dilemma that like, man, I can't grow anymore. I can't put size on. I'm thinking that this is, this girl is not trying to do what I'm doing right now. Well, I'm, even then my, I, my advice would be to, because it's usually not a macronutrient. It's, when you see gut issues and I'll address what Adam's talking about, uh, because there's, I think there's more of the story too. Oh yeah. You this. mean like as far as gluten or dairy well, or because, going deeper yeah, because, into what exactly it is? Yeah. Because called. usually it's not, that's a good. That's a too good many point. carbs or too many proteins. It, that's I a mean, good point. She could probably increase. More than likely, she could probably increase rice and sweet potatoes and be fine all day. Yeah. Long. So it, it, go a little deeper because right. it's rarely just uh, carbs. Right. If it was just carbs, which it could be, by the way, it doesn't mean it's impossible. Check could, the bread and be, dairy. That's all, almost always for clients, man. Well, not only that, but let's say it was just carbs. Let's say it didn't matter what her carbs were. She ate all the foods that she didn't have intolerances to. Just eating too many carbs. Is giving her sensitive gut, then I would look. De- I would look deeper in that and say and look at potential bacterial overgrowths or yeast, uh, because carbohydrates tend to feed certain types of bacteria and certain types of yeast in the body. In which case, you would need to balance your body out and then be able to up your carbs. So, like Adam, for you, I'll ask you on your on your carb intake. Have you been able to identify? What particular carbs yes. that are doing it? Yeah, or is it general yeah I know. Yeah, I know. Okay. And I should have. I should have specified. It's because I introduced pancakes and bread back in. When I when I'm eating pancakes and having sandwiches or bread inside the diet, the psoriasis comes up. If I had chosen to go through rice and sweet potato, I would have been fine. Mm. But so. it's hard to eat those because they're not as highly palatable Excellent. and the calories. We also want to explain that because I know listeners are like, well, don't fucking eat the rice. And the, right. But you're trying to eat 5,000 calories. Right. Hmm. It's not as palatable to have a bowl of rice yeah, as it is to have to do. some pancakes. So um, I think the point, you know, Adam's making, you know, he's pushing his body above and beyond um you know, normal muscularity. You know, you're, t- you know, he's a he's a big guy who wants to get up to you know 230 pounds or whatever or more. Um, so it's kind of an interesting dilemma. It would be interesting to watch too how you solve that problem because um, uh, that's a that would be a pretty cool thing to solve, right? Because we have a lot of people who are stuck in between that who really like to push their body to the limit, but then also want to maximize. Well, that's you know, kind of the answer. I've just I have to become more like for example i have routines right where i eat breakfast and then what i typically eat for lunch and then when i'm on the gain i just kind of add to those things right it just it's simpler for my life to just add to my already kind of current routines of where i eat i just and like the whole pancakes thing the, the way that works is i still have the same thousand calorie or so breakfast now i'm slapping on an extra 600 calories of pancakes after i eat that breakfast in addition to that or you know later on at night where you know i would have uh my normal dinner then i'll have it will go grab a peanut butter and jelly sandwich after i finish that meal so that is what was killing me and so now what i have to do is places in my diet where i would normally have a cup of rice i'm going to have two three cups of rice and and i recommend scheduling that this around your workouts 
So if you are somebody who does start to introduce the carbs back in because you're yeah, trying make to make the most of them, right? Yeah, I would I would put the bulk of them around uh, before and after your training session so that you know that a majority of them are getting put to use versus sitting in your because I feel like they're less likely to cause issues. Uh, with your gut, if you're if they're going right mm-hmm. to use versus over consuming them, which is what I feel like a lot of people. But I'll tell do. you this right now, 100. percent If you have gut issues right now, and your goal is to build muscle or burn body fat, and you address the gut issue and you start to fix that, you will see yourself build muscle and burn fat Agreed. much easier. Agreed. Especially for, in my opinion, like I don't know this girl completely, but I'm guessing she's not trying to look like me as far as a 200 pound chick and just be massive i could be wrong but more than likely she just wants to build some muscle she's probably talking about pasta she's it italian does. so yeah. and pasta's chock full of right yeah gluten. yes avoid shit like that for sure yeah quick commercial break hey people ask us all the time how they can support mind pump here's what you can do uh you can go to www.brain.fm forward slash mind pump and get 20% off Brain FM for meditation or focus. You can also go to audibletrial.com forward slash mind pump and get a 30 day trial plus one free audio book. Lastly, you can go to getnatureblend.com forward slash mind pump and you will get a discount on Ben Greenfield's CBD product. The Hoffmeister 89 is getting married in late September. And yeah. is asking, what's the best time to restrict water to dry out for the big day? Get the fuck out of here. Did you guys make this question up? You know what? I, have, I want to what's talk. He, is he going to be walking down the aisle naked I, on stage? Yeah. Up? Yeah. Like, I want to talk about this, actually, because. This I, is a real question, huh? Just yesterday, I had somebody. Wa- I was walking on the treadmill with Katrina, and um, a friend of a friend who was getting ready for a show this weekend came up to me and said, Hey, Adam, I'm in peak week. Uh, any last minute advice? And I said, well, tell me, walk me through what you're doing right now with kind of sodium and water. And the reason why I asked that is because I think it's one of the uh, biggest misconceptions that Mm. uh, people have with, you know, drying out as the term goes. Uh, It's done wrong. It's not, it's not smart. It's not right. And I know that I'm sure I'm pissing some bodybuilder off who's listening because he's got on stage and he looked awesome this way. Here's the deal. 60% 60% of your fucking muscles is water. So to dry them out completely would be to think of what you would do to a water balloon. You're going to pull all the water out of the water balloon, and what's it going to look like when you pull all the water out? You don't want that. You don't want all the water pulled con- completely out. Now, we also have subcutaneous water that's floating all around us also. Now, that would be okay to pull some of that out. But really, that's the crazy science of what these guys are trying to figure out through all this bro science of loading up the sodium with just the right amount, pulling just the right amount of water. So I pull some of the water out of me, but then I also leave enough in my muscle bellies to where I still fill out. Here, here's why this is one of the this most ridiculous questions I've ever seen. I'll tell you why. I'm sorry, <laughs> Hofmeister, for, oh, if I'm hurting your feelings. Off. But uh, the the difference that water manipulation will make on the appearance of your physique is zero unless you're super fucking lean. Right. Yeah. So if you're in the single digit, low single digit body fat percentage, then water manipulation will make a difference. If you're 9%, 10% body fat, which is still lean, you probably still have a six pack, Water manipulation, not going to make a fucking difference. Here's the second thing. Second thing. If you're getting married, you're likely wearing a tuxedo, okay? So all people are going to see is your face. Do you know what yeah. looks worse on your body when you manipulate water? Your face. Mm. Your face looks like shit. So when these bodybuilders <laughs> and athletes, it's true. When these bodybuilders and athletes are drying themselves out to go on stage and they're at 2% body fat and it makes them look, look shredded. You look gaunt. Take a look. Take a close look at their face, yeah. dry and fucked up, and they they can't well, really me, talk, and it's because they have no spit. It's this is part of why this is an issue. I actually was just talking to uh, we mentioned her on the show, the girl Jessica that I'm helping out. What happens to a lot of these competitors as they're getting ready for a show? Their coaches look at their bodies, and their conditioning is nowhere near where it should be to get yeah. on show and compete. So they it's start, a last ditch effort. It is. It's yeah. a last ditch ditch effort to try and 
make them look smaller Mm -hmm. by pulling all this water out and dropping. And so, and you see the scale go down. So in your head, you think you're losing something. All you're doing is pulling the water out of your muscles. You're not making your body look any better whatsoever. Maybe you think you are because you're looking smaller. And if you're a bikini girl who's trying to get in shape and you want to look smaller, that's what's happening. But if you are conditioned, if you were conditioned right, like Sal's saying, you're getting ready for your your wedding day. That's everything. Like it's not if you got September. Yeah, you want to enjoy it? What well, the hell? I, that's what that's I'm laughing so at. So ridiculous. Right now. Yeah, I'm laughing. Why you didn't do all that? I'm thinking of uh, all the things that you do on your. On imagine day. he goes right to have a drink. Hey, of, of it's beer. a fair. It's <laughs> a. <laughs> <laughs> like right after that, uh, think about starts think, puking. Think about this way: it's yeah. a oh. fair question. It's super popular to hear this right now. You got to understand. But hold on, people hold on. are crazy. Hold on, okay. Uh, so me and Justin have both been married, so we know all the rigor, rigor, you know, whatever the fuck. What's that the word? The rigor, stress, dude. Rigor, all this, yeah, okay. think about. But forget your that. He's going to kill each other. Before we get in, it. before we get into that, I'm going to ask Adam because Adam's actually competed. Yeah. How awesome do you feel going into a contest, water restricted? There we go. How do you Let's feel mentally? There. How does your there. body feel? Do you know that that's the hardest part of, for competing? Was because you're feeding the last day or two because you're filling your muscle bellies up with carbohydrates. So the hardest is the taking away of water. You're so fucking thirsty. You're cotton mouth and irritable because your your mouth is so dry, you feel like, like you're, uh, yeah. foggy. Your right, I'm yeah. telling you, you're dying. Yeah, yeah. No. You feel like shit, right? Dehydration is not okay. a fun feeling. So you feel like shit. You're getting married, which <laughs> Let's requires add you. This into the yeah, you're, you're, you're like, this is supposed to be one of the greatest days of your life or memorable. Right. You're walking down the aisle in front of a bunch of people. You're going to say some vows to the woman you're devoting your life you're to. You're stressed out. Your crazy aunt's going to show up yeah. with the 12 kids, you know, <laughs> that weren't invited. You got to make a fucking speech. You got to cut yeah. a cake in front of people. Yeah. You got to dance. You're going to drink alcohol. Yeah. What the fuck are you it, thinking? Trying to restrict water going to this do that? is the worst idea. Oh my God. You'll ever. make an ass of yourself. So yeah. I'm going to, so, because because Justin and Sal just made you feel like a piece of shit, I'm going to give you some really good advice that's generic yeah, work on getting lean otherwise. okay yeah this is generic advice but it's i think it should be good advice for what you're trying to do it's september okay you got plenty of fucking time what is that how many weeks away is that from that what are we in right now we're, we're almost in uh we're july, july, still. july august I mean, yeah you got fucking bro you can be shredded by september unless you're Super fat, I'll you can be shredded, be shredded by September. September. Unless, you're, shredded yeah. September. unless you're super fat, yeah, that's, and, a tech, that's a medical yeah. term. By right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're super fat, well, drawing out water is not going to do anything for oh, you shit. whatsoever. <laughs> so you got plenty of time. Your goal between now and then should be donut, get you know to be mean? get to get as lean <laughs> as you possibly can. Get as lean and as shredded as you possibly can by eating properly leading up to it. That is going to make the biggest difference on that day. Then when you get close to that time. So also during this whole process, make sure you eat plenty of sodium in your diet. Sodium is perfectly fine and all the bullshit out there that you can't have that is not true whatsoever and it's very essential to you. So have lots of sodium and in the, in fact, go out of your way to get sodium coming into that final week. Then when you get into that final week and you're trying to manipulate some of your water, you need to make sure that you've already been drinking lots of water and then you just you pull back a little bit on it. You don't need a to pull a ton because you want water in your system. You don't want to cut water. And what I'm right. saying by a little bit, you have to slowly introduce and ramp your way up first is what you're saying to even be able to then start scaling out right. and do it safely. Right. So when I would, when I would get ready for a show, I would push as high as two to three gallons of water and then come down to one, which is still more than what the average person fucking drinks. So all I'm doing is conditioning my body to pushing that much water in and out of it. That way, when I have just one, it pushes a majority of it that's not being used. So yeah, I, I, here's my advice: uh, fucking practice your speech. Think <laughs> yeah. about how you want to spend the rest of your Can life. I tell you guys what happened at this, my wedding. Yeah, yeah, go. Yeah, dude. Like, okay, just did to you give drop? You a did little, you drop your water going? Into- <laughs> well, yeah. So like, people showed up that weren't supposed to, right? Oh, huh? so, yeah. So not only that, like, I invited some people. Like before that, so leading up to that. Uh, you, what's it called when you have when when your side of the family hosts like the the dinner or whatever? What's it called? Yeah, what's I that don't know. dinner called? Rehearsal dinner. Rehearsal dinner. There you Thank go. you, Jesus Christ, God, Sal. You were married th- anyway. I'm trying to <laughs> nobody trying to, knows. Obviously, I know. I'm trying to block shut it off. off. Obviously, an awful shut husband. It, yeah. Shut it off. <laughs> so we're we're sitting there and like ahead of time. I knew my my mom already did this with my brother. I asked her specifically not to do this. Sorry, mom. I'm throwing you under the bus right now. But uh, <laughs> so what happened was like. Uh, we like she decided that she really wanted to, uh, because of our heritage, you know, Scotch, Irish, like we ha- we all like have bagpipes and we have oh, no. you know like uh, kilts and all that kind of stuff, 
And so, you know, I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. You know, like Courtney, like we're, we're just, we're, we're good. You know, we don't need all that attention. And like, we're going to be at a really nice restaurant. And like, I don't want like what you did to my brother, like to happen, you know, to me, whatever. Oh yeah, no problem. Blah, blah, blah. She does it anyway. Right. So we're out there. This fucking bagpipers coming like no. from around the corners. Like walking through there was another wedding party in the same restaurant with us they're getting fucking like pissed off and infuriated you know and like <laughs> like yeah, like courtney's crying like everybody's <laughs> oh my god i'm just like oh yeah. no i'm just saying that's one scenario yeah. that's just one scenario dude, i'm not even gonna go into the rest of it dude my at, at my wedding we ordered we had all these these uh dishes that were gonna come out now in in italian weddings especially in the south they feed you until you fucking die. Like, <laughs> they feed you so much food. Yeah. It's scary. Like, they stuff you with food <laughs> yeah. over and an incredible Just food. Constant barrage and, of spoons. Oh, in mouth. you, you yeah. leave. Usually, you leave a wedding and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to make it through the night. That's how much food they feed you, right? So, in America, not so much. You usually leave a fucking American wedding yeah. starving. You end up drive, going through a drive through because you're hungry. So, we had family from Italy and then my grandfather, you know, is obviously here. My grandfather does not give a fuck. Yeah. Like he'll say whatever he's going to say, right? So they bring out they bring out the first dish and we specifically told the people, you're going to serve raviolis to Italian people. Yeah. Fill the bowl. Like give them fucking a big thing of raviolis. Yeah. Well, I don't know why in America when they serve you shit sometimes, they serve you one or two to make it look cute, right? Mm-hmm. So they bring out a dish with two fucking ravioli. Everybody gets two ravioli as one of their first dish. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, Oh shit. Two? Yeah. I'm Come like, on, oh man. shit. Uh, this is not going to be good. Yeah. So I'm Hellfire. watching people. Yeah. I'm watching people. And then the lady serves it to my grandfather. So right away she puts like the plate two. in front of my grandfather. <laughs> plop, and he plop. goes, he looks at it and he goes, what's this? He goes, oh, that's your, that's your ravioli. He goes, I know ravioli. I'm Italian. Yeah. He goes, what the fuck is this? He gives it back to her. He goes, bring it back with at least 10 times as many ravioli. <laughs> <laughs> he was the only one in the front. I said yeah. something. Everybody else was yeah. like, oh. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, prepare for your wedding by preparing for the unexpected. I'm just telling you, and dude. don't restrict your. It's, wedding. I, it's I tell you storm. what, if you remember who, uh, whoever this is, if you remember to to DM me at one point, I think this is a good topic for me to talk about on my Insta story to get into what peak weeks look like, the misconception. Yeah, that's a good. That's a very good topic, uh, of a peak week. Like I'll talk all about peak week for a day if you remind me to do this and what I saw in the bodybuilding world that is so fucked up and wrong about it. And some little takeaways that you can do to improve that. But honestly, like the boys are saying, it's your wedding. Fucking enjoy your day. You don't want to be dehydrated while you're out on the wedding. It's not going to make that big of a difference. The biggest difference that you can make right now is you conditioning yourself leading up to that. If you come in to your wedding day at 5 or 6% body fat, nothing is going to make a bigger difference than that. And then when it comes to that... You, I tell you what, come for your wedding gift from me to you. I will prep you for the final five days for your wedding. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put that out there. You can hold me accountable to that. Look if at you, that. If you, you bring, guys, the if guys you, service. Adam's gonna talk him into not getting married. If you, if, if, <laughs> if, if you bring me, a, now, listen, yeah, you gotta bring now me. Now we're going a, to Vegas. You gotta bring me a solid lean physique because if you show me a picture of your fat ass and you want me to help <laughs> oh, you with no. your water, I'm oh. gonna just tell you straight up, like just yeah. go enjoy. It's your, not the water, man. Just go enjoy your day, motherfucker. Because <laughs> I can't put help you. Put down the donut. It's right. So do that from now till then which means i have high expectations for how lean you should be able to get in september <laughs> when you get down to single digit body fat then what i can do from there is i'll help you manipulate some my, water a little mind bit pump adam was so generous he helped my fiance out but now he doesn't want to get married anymore yeah. he wants to be a bachelor for the rest <laughs> yeah. of his life. now now we're just friends hey uh so a lot of people may not realize this but we are still doing 30 days of coaching uh and it's still for free so you go to mindpumpmedia.com and you register and you'll get 30 days worth of information that covers all kinds of different topics from, you know, resistance training to meditation to gut health, basically everything that you need uh, for wellness, health, fitness, and performance. Also, if you want to ask us a question that we answer on an episode like this one, the place to do it is on Instagram. The page to do it on is Mind Pump Media. We also have personal pages. Mine is Mind Pump Sal, Adam is Mind Pump Adam, and Justin is Mind Pump Justin. Finally, Go to YouTube, subscribe to our channel. We post a brand new video every single day. Nobody else does that, or at least if they do, they copied us. 
So make sure you go there and subscribe. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.